Hello students, welcome to EPG Patasala. I am Dr. Ram Mohan, Associate Professor, Head Department of Anthropology, Sikkim University. Today we are going to talk a module on transactionalism. This module is from the paper Theories and Methods in Social and Cultural Anthropology. So before we go to this module, let us see what are the learning outcomes from this module. So this module will basically help you to gain insights into the interactionalist theory in anthropology, to understand the motto behind the actions of individuals living in a society, to make a clear-cut understanding of the concept of transactionalism or we can also say interactionalism. Now what is this whole transactionalism is about? Transactionalism was given by Frederick Barth as long as in 1950s. Then F.G. Bailey also uh, made significant co contributions uh, in this uh, school of uh, thought. So Barth and Bailey took on uh, this transactionalism only to see some flaws with the uh, the structural functionalist view proposed by Ratley Brown. So uh, to, to know more about transactionalism, transactionalism is also referred as a methodological individualism in a sense that it shares resemblance with uh, symbolic interactionalism in a sense that how people interact and what kind of meanings they derive and why do they interact in the way they do. So transactionalism considers social behavior as a series of exchanges between individuals. For example, if I interact with a, a person B, in what way I interact? What is the motto of my interaction with the person B or vice versa? The person B is interacting with me. What does he derive out of it? We are all aware that there is a structure is there, but oblivion to that structure the, of a society, in a sense that individuals who are pursuing their self-interest, which was in the contrast to the view of a structure functionalism, where they say that you know each social institution is designed or derived to satisfy the individual needs from a functionalist point of view and the structural functionalist there should be a structure to integrate these institutions who are giving functional aspects but coming to the reality level which is based on the individual level so transactionalism is more interested towards how particular individuals or individual members in a society interact with other members of the society and what does it come out. So for Frederick Barth, he is under the opinion that there was no moral consensus exist among people, but they are in a state of agreement with the society's expectations. In a sense that morally what is right, what is wrong, Apart from the society's expectation, you have individuals have their own ways of what is morality. For me, what is right could be what is wrong to you. But individual members are not divided of the what society expects from you. How should you behave? What happens if you don't behave in certain social order or moral order? So in that sense, in terms of action, people are guided much less by the needs of the society than by their individual desires. If I want something, I try to interact rather than what society dictates to me. So it is my self-interest which is triggering me to act with other members of the society. Because I want to eat, I have to eat. I want to earn money, I earn money. Society is there, but we are the part of the society. Society is nothing but the individual in this sense. Though society is considered to be the sum total of exchanges and interactions between individuals who mostly seek self-interest. Why do I marry? 
or why do I need a family? Because I need a family, I have to marry. Because I show some interest. So it is through these self-interest which are reflected in the larger social structure. But this is what Barth says that people are more motivated, people are more provoked, people are more interested in their own self-interest at an individual level. So according to Barth, this view of behavior would allow the anthropologist to view and analyze those areas which a structural functionist could not. See, structural functionism basically it's like a grand theory which did not look upon how one member interacts, what kind of process takes place between two individuals, with that two individuals, with another two individuals, another two individuals. So that, that part uh, structural functionalism could not uh, give or pay attention to, but rather Barth's transactionalism or interactionalism, which stress to see more at a micro level than at a macro level. So before Barth, Marcel Mass, French intellectual, has discussed about the concept of gift exchange. And this famous book is The Gift and the expectations and results behind such exchange. So why do people give gifts in terms of economic pursuit? The rational behind giving and taking gifts is purely economic, which has also has a social function. So after Marshall Mars, the influential figure behind Barth was Adam Smith as a great economist who mentioned about the self-benefit and the self-interested motive of individuals behind all the economic behavior. Why do people produce? Why do people sell? Why do we buy? All these economic transactions are nothing but, though it has a larger connotation meaning, but individually all these things are nothing but is a part and parcel of self-interested which has been given as an economic behavior. So another interesting uh, uh, anthropologist uh, or sociologist we can say, Erwin Goffman was also the source of information for Frederick Barth where he said all social interaction between a members of society entails individuals trying to influence others in order to obtain their goals. You see if I am trying to talk to someone that I want something. I want this, I want that, you want this, you want that. So that means we are going to other individuals, we are trying to influence them to seek our own benefits. So Barth has used three assumptions which was propounded by Adam Smith, the great economist, who says that people are free to make choices between various choices. So that means there is a rationality. Every individual you have a range of choices. You, you want this, you, this, this, this. So within this range of choices, I have the liberty to choose what to buy, what to buy, what not to buy, what, how to talk, whether I can talk with this man, whether I can talk with that man, I can do this thing or I can do that thing. You have a range of choices. And we have the will to choose these choices. So in that sense, people are rational. People can clearly calculate the cost and benefit of a particular course of action. So in a sense, they are little judicious. What if in an economic terms, what will I gain if I do this in terms of money, in terms of energy, in terms of benefits? So what we are trying to do at the end of the day is that <coughs> people are maximizing their self-interest. We are self-centered. That means I am living for my own self. I am not living for you. He is living for himself. He is not living for you. So here the whole process in transactionalism is the concept or the object of exchange. I give you give kind of a thing. So according to Frederick Barth, the object of interaction between people is what he calls as prestation, a term coined by Marcel Mass. 
Here it, there is a kind of a transaction what he calls as prestation. So in his book, The Models of Social Organization, Barth argues that all social relationships correspond to this kind of form. For example, individual A offers prestation to X, then to individual B, and B individual responds to A in, in prestation in exchange. And here, the process of object is Y. So we can mathematically calculate. So for me, for individual A, put it mathematically, X is not greater than way. So there is a mathematical way, he proved in a mathematical way that X into B into A is equal to all these things. So in this interaction, both persons A and B think for their own profit. So what they have invested. I gave something to the, so I'm giving something, so I'm expecting more from what I gave. The same principle also applicable to the other person. That he also expect the same that he needs more what he has offered to you. So if this condition is not present, then there exists no long term social relationship between A and B. So here the concept of utility comes here. If I'm not getting any kind of profit from you, if I'm not getting any kind of value from what I have given to you, why do I continue my relation with you? So in that sense, this transactionism goes on. So the most important work by Frederick Barth is on the Swat Patans of Pakistan. In Frederick Bass, the political leadership in Swat Patans, which was published as long ago as 1959, the central issue of this whole ethnographic work is, can equality be consensual? In a sense that, in this exchange process, whether inequality still exists, or inequality has any meaningful existence. So the people of this region are mainly, their they have the Islamic faith, but here and there, we, Bart says that Hinduism aspects of caste kind of a system was also prevalent in these Swat Patans. And the entire state of Swat Patans was under the leadership called known as Wali. Now, this interesting work shows that how different groups in this region are mutually benefiting each other. And that is the reason of this uh, transactionalism. Group A, Group B, Group C. Group A is expecting something from the Group B, Group B is expecting from Group C, Group C is again Group A. So in a sense that all groups are expecting more from their interaction in their transactions, which was not given by the earlier French intellectual functionalism and structural functionalism. So according to Bach, the economic and political contacts are independent of each other. Now, they might be having a political structure, but that political structure is not linked to the economic structure. These two are like parallels, but they are not connected. So one has to understand the concept of a processual theory. So at a given point of time, how people have lived experience which is articulated. So processual theory was given by Frederick Barth in 1966, as I said in his famous book, Models of Social Organization, how a, so a society organizes itself and what are the models so that we can derive it out. Now, the basic aim of Frederick Barth was to explain how, what are the different kinds of social forms existing in these groups. And one of the basic argument by Frederick Barth is to explain one form, social form, one needs to discover and describe the process that generate the form. See, process is like a continuous process. Social form is the end product. Because of this social processes taking place at individual level, and this culminates into one certain social form, and this social form can be different from one society to another society. That is the job one has to, anthropologist has to look for. 
It could be of any type of society. How people live, what kind of exchanges that takes place, what he says that the processual aspects, the lived experiences at that particular given point of time. And Barth calls this as very substantiative, solidified, which are self-explanatory theories and can, they are generative models. With this model, there is another model. With this model, there will be another model. So it gives multiple explanations and interpretations in this exchange of interactions between people. Another significant contribution in this school of thought of transactions is given by F.G. Bailey. F.G. Bailey is famously known for his extensive ethnographic work in the state of Orissa, particularly the village of Bisipara. So he was, Bailey was interested to see the ongoing and long conflict between two different caste, Hindu caste groups. What we call the pure purity or the clean caste of the priests, warriors, headsmen, and the ritually polluting lower caste as untouchables. Now, what is this ongoing conflict? And what kind of transactions taking place, interaction taking place between these two caste groups? Because caste is a social group, a social identity. So with this social identity, people interact. So how does this operate, which is different from Barth's study of Swatpatans? And this caste group is called pan, pan, pan caste, which are landless. And their main occupation is they are very, uh, because they don't have land, they are agricultural laborers. And they are also in the occupation of amazing, uh, making some musical instruments like drums with uh, dead cat, uh, cattle meat skin. Sometimes occasionally they are beggars. And they are also uh, into, into the polluting occupation, quote unquote polluting occupation, processing of the dead animals. So, Bailey was interested, given this kind of a, a structural makeup, at one hand you have this upper clean caste, pure caste, on the other hand you have this untouchables or in that context they are considered to be as polluting caste because they are in, in constant touch with the dead animals. In that sense they are polluting. So in given the social order which is historically been there for a long time, that puns were the bottom of the social order because in the lowest rung of the social order in a hierarchy because of their origin and occupation and the interaction takes place because of their social order because of this Raja and the Praja, the king subject relationship because someone has land owning and you don't have land. Now interestingly what happened during the beginning of 20th century, many of this lower caste pun group had an opportunity to improve themselves in terms of social mobility. So here they want to bring change in their own community. So they got some education. They were placed in government jobs. And their economy has still has gained some importance. At some point of time in mid-century, the puns basically evolved into an economically independent social group, unlike in their previous generations. So they, they are no more dependent on the, the Raja or the upper caste group. They have their own jobs, they have their own small, small assets and all. And due to the uh, affirmative actions by the government of India, untouchability was also banned. However, they could come out of a little social mobility, but they are still at the lower rung of the society in that area your caste identity still remain. 
no matter you have a government job they have a little piece of land and they are economically dependent so this social identity did not please them very well but they are still considered as untouchables they are still considered in the eyes of the upper caste despite their educational mobility despite their economic mobility despite their other social things which they gave a little mobility in terms of their previous generations but still in the eyes of the other communities they are still untouchables they did not like them so what did they do they had a strategy to improve their social standing within the caste system which perhaps could become very deliberate over a period of time so they want to have some kind of a strategy for their social change which are into basically two things one is symbolic and the other one is social at a symbolic level all pan caste men started wearing the sacred thread wear by the brahmins which is an indication that you are a brahmin or which you belongs to a pure caste and they started building temples and at the other level they also started not taking cattle meat they become a little conscious of their eating habits parallelly pan women also started wearing the upper caste women dress and they stopped begging in the streets performing music in the streets so they are trying to imitate the so called clean ritually pure upper caste in that area symbolically they are doing like this and socially they are also become economically independent of their own class now what happens what happens in this social process because this caste are becoming socially mobility so in the conflict between the pans and the upper caste bailey was focusing something new and different so bailey was interested how this social process is taking place at various acts of individual from social structure which is manifested so bailey also emphasizes a strategic process by which people hope and try to benefit themselves at the stake of others so here if you look at closely in detail it is not at the structural level that the puns are challenging it is because of your own personal benefit you are challenging the other persons so to improve oneself so in that sense they are challenging the structuralist form that bailey refuse refers to social structure as normative rules which are basically set on conventional standards and regulations that makes differences between what is right and what is wrong so bailey's work on this book on the strategies and the spoils the social anthropology of this whole political process is one of the works that brought to full maturity in this processual theory and analysis so there was a shift of thinking from people as acting strictly in terms of their statuses and roles and if people conform to the normative rules so what happens if a people are conforming to only to the normative rules of the society on the other hand people are acting strictly what is their status and what is their role here there was an increased recognition that all people acted intentionally willfully to gain something their intentions were very clear and at times it is beyond the normative rules also the structural rules of that particular society and people's actions could change the structure and institutions within which they lived 
So what happened the, the, the end process here? There was some change at the structural level because of the people's actions. In this ethnographic case of Bailey, so there was no looking down by the upper caste and there is no ritually polluting things because people intentionally changed their behavior. So there could be some change in the structural level, which is basically normative rules. So what do we understand by these two classical ethnographic studies in transactionalism? So to summarize this transactionalism, it deals with individuals acting according to the situation in order to benefit oneself. Like what we see, what we understood in, in, in uh, Barth's Swatpatans, where all the groups are mutually benefiting each other, which is independent of the political transactions they have. On the other level also we can see the ethnographic study of Bailey's work on Bisipara, where two different social category groups have transactions which have changed the normative structure of the society. So this transactionalism theory basically was critical to the structural functionalism says that where individuals have no function, only social institutions have the functions. But in transactionalism, individuals can have a greater role in changing the normative rules of the social structure, which is challenging the grand structure of structural functionalism. So with this transactionalism, one can gain deeper insights that how a social group functions and how what is the processual approach towards gaining one particular social form. So in that way, a social process is a lived experience which gives to an end product.